Capital, my dear Watson. Let us return to our humble abode. Two two one B Baker Street, please, Cabby. From London, we present Shoscombe Old Place by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio by Michael Hardwick, with Carlton Hobbs as Sherlock Holmes and Norman Shelley as Doctor Watson. You know something of racing, don't you, Watson? Uh, I ought to. I pay for it with about half my wound pension. <laughs> then I'll make you my handy guide to the turf. Does the name Sir Robert Norberton recall anything? I should say so. He lives at Shoscombe Old Place. My summer quarters were down there one day. But you know, Norberton nearly came within your province once. Oh? How was that? It was when he horsewhipped Sam Brewer, the Curzon Street moneylender on Newmarket Heath. He nearly killed him. He sounds interesting. Does he often uh, indulge in that way? He has the name of being a dangerous man. One of those fellows who overshot that true generation. He should have been a Regency buck. A great eye for the ladies, boxer, athlete, and about the most daredevil rider in the country. Came second in the Grand National a few years back. Oh. They say that what he's lost on the turf has got him so far down Queer Street that he may never find his way back again. Capital, Watson. An admirable thumbnail sketch. Now... Can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place? Well, only this is in the middle of Shoscombe Park in Berkshire. The Shoscombe started in training quarters are there. And the head trainer is John Mason. Oh. You didn't look so surprised, my dear Watson. He was due here some minutes ago. But do let us have some more about Shoscombe. I seem to have struck a rich vein. <laughs> well, uh, the Shoscombe Spaniels. You hear of them at every dog show. They're the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Sir Robert Norberton's wife? No, no, no. He's never married. Huh? Just as well, I should think, considering his prospect. He lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Falder. Matter of fact, the place belonged to her late husband. Norberton has no claim on it at all. When she dies, it reverts to her husband's brother. So she only has a life interest in it. That's right. She draws the rents and Norberton spends them. Still, I've heard that she's devoted to him... But what's amiss at Shoscombe, Holmes? Ah, that's just what I want to do. And here, I expect, is the man who can tell us. John Mason, sir. Ah, oh, Mr. Mason. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? You had my note, Mr. Holmes? Yes, but it explained nothing. Oh, it was too delicate a thing to put the details on paper. And too complicated. Well, here we are, at your disposal... Oh, do sit down. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, first of all, Mr. Holmes, I think my employer, Sir Robert Norberton, has gone mad. This is Baker Street, Mr. Mason, not Harley Street. But why do you say that? Well, sir, when a man does one odd thing or two odd things, there may be a meaning to it. But when everything he does is odd, and you begin to wonder, I reckon the Shoscombe Prince and the Derby have turned his brain between them. Holmes, Shoscombe Prince is a coat Sir Robert has entered. Oh, he's the best in England, and I should know if anyone does. But I'll be plain with you gentlemen now, because I know this won't go beyond the room. Sir Robert has got to win this derby. He's up to his neck. It's his last chance. Everything he can raise or borrow is on that horse, and at fine odds, too. Yes, but how's that, Mr. Mason, with a horse as good as that? Well, the public don't know how good he is, Dr. Watson. Sir Robert's too clever for the touts. He has the prince's half bell right for spins. I can't tell him apart. But there are two lengths and a furlong between them when it comes to a gallop. No, sir. His whole life is on the prince. If he fails him, he's done. It seems rather a desperate gamble. But where does the madness come in? Well, first of all, you've only got to look at him. His eyes are, are wild. He's down at the stables at all hours. And there's the way he behaves to Lady Beatrice. Oh? In what way? Well, they've always been the best of friends. She loves the horses as much as he does. Why, Shoscombe Prince, when he heard her coming, he, he trot out to the carriage for his lump of sugar every time. Uh, but that's all over now. What? Well, she seems to have lost all interest. For a week now, she's just driven past the stables without so much as a good morning. You think there's been a quarrel? Oh, a bitter quarrel, if you ask me, sir. Why else would he give away her pet spaniel? Her spaniel? Oh, she loved it as if it were a child. He gave it away a few days ago to old Barnes, what keeps the green dragon down at Crendel. Strange indeed. Of course, what with her weak heart and dropsy, she couldn't get about with Sir Robert, but he used to spend a couple of hours with her in her room every evening. 
That's all over, too. Mm. He never goes near her. She takes it to Archer. It's all changed, Mr. Holmes. Everything's changed. And something going on. Mark my words. There's something more, then. All right, that there is, sir. Night after night, the master sneaks off down to the crypt of the old church. Church? Oh, it's an old ruined chapel in the park. Oh, I see. Ah, a dark, damp place it is, too. Bad enough by day. There's not many in our parts will think of going there by night. Haunted, no doubt. Ah, you may smile, Mr. Holmes. It's had a bad name amongst us for generations. Anyway, there he goes every night, wet or fine. You interest me more and more, Mr. Mason. But how do you know all this? Well, it was my head lad Stevens noticed him sneaking off, first of all, and told me. It's none of our business, perhaps you'll say. But we went after him. We waited behind a bush and saw him go inside the crypt. This is jumpy work, all right, Fred. It'll be a bad job for us if he spots us. Ah, he's no respecter of persons when he gets started. Still, I mean to see this out. Oh, you shan't see much from here. You think we can go inside and take a look? Oh, not in your life. It is for sure. Oh, there's not much we can do then, except follow him home again. Well, you never know. He might be carrying something to give us some idea. Yeah. Hey, watch out. He's coming out now. Yeah, well, keep down then. He'll come past these bushes. Yeah, you're right. Well, his hands were empty. So where does that get us? We don't know. We could, uh, we could take a look inside. Now he's gone. In, inside? Oh. oh, I don't know, John. Come on, man, come on. The master can go in there. I reckon we can. Well, no. We'll not rest easy till we get to the bottom of this. Wait out here for me, if you like. No, I'll come. What's that over there? Huh? Where? Here. Oh, that's funny. It's, it's bones. Bones and a, a, and a skull. Oh, it is too. You've been down here before, Fred. Once or twice. In daylight, though. No? I was here some time back when Master sent Higgins to see those gypsies weren't camping out in the place. And these weren't here then. Are you sure? Certain. John. Maybe it's... You don't reckon... No, no, they're old bones, these. Might be hundreds of years old. Where do they come from? Why should anyone drag them out and leave them lying around like this? Yeah. This beats me, Fred. It beats me. And beat both of us it did, Mr. Holmes. You left the bones where they were? Aye, lying in a corner with a bit of old board over them. And now, Mr. Holmes, take a look at this. Huh? A piece of the bones? No, sir, not them. This was a day or two later. There's a heating furnace under Lady Beatrice's room. It had been off for some time, but Sir Robert started complaining about the cold, so we started up again. And the other morning, when one of the boys was raking out the cinders, he found this bone. You can see it's been burnt. Mm. What do you make of this, Watson? Mm. Well, it's human, all right. The upper condyle of a human femur. Exactly. And, Mr. Mason, could anyone who wanted to visit the furnace? Aye, sir. There's a door from outside, and there's another to a stair from a passage where Lady Beatrice's room is. Was Sir Robert at home on the night before the boy found this bone? Er, uh, no, sir, he wasn't. He'd gone off to London. Then whoever was burning bones, it was not he. That's true, sir. Well, these are deep waters indeed. Deep and rather dirty. Have you anything more to tell me? No, sir. I think, sir... That's about all of it. A few questions, then. When did Sir Robert give away his sister's dog? Just a week ago today, sir. It was howling outside the old wellhouse, and Sir Robert was in one of his tantrums that day. Mm-hmm. He caught it up. I thought he would have killed it. But he gave it to one of the jockeys and said to take it to old Barnes of the Green Dragon. He said he never wanted to see it again. Thank you. Now, who keeps Lady Beatrice Falder company most of the time? Well, as her maid, Carrie... She's been with her about uh, five years. And is no doubt devoted to her mistress. Well, uh, well she's devoted enough, but I'd, I'd rather not say who to. Uh-huh. Well, I, I can't tell tales of that sort, sir. I quite understand. 
From Dr. Watson's description of Sir Robert, I can realize that no woman is safe from him. Don't you think the quarrel between brother and sister may lie there? Well, the scandal's been pretty clear for a long time. Yes, but she may not have seen it before. However, this scarcely accounts for charred bones and these mysterious visits to the crypt. Is there good fishing in that part of Berkshire? Fishing, sir. Fishing, Mr. Mason. Well, there were trout in the mill stream and pike in the old lake. That's good enough. Watson and I are famous fishermen. Are we not, Watson? Uh, well, um, uh, Precisely. In fact, you may address us in future at the Green Dragon, I think you said it was called, Mr. Mason. Sure. We should reach it tonight. I need hardly say that we'd better not be seen with you down there. But a note will reach us if you want us. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Barnes. My friend and I are very comfortable indeed. Very comfortable. Yes. Uh, but tell me, uh, what do you think about the whole lake and the chance of a fight tomorrow? The hall? Oh, no. No, that wouldn't do at all, sir. Why, how's that? Well, you might chance to find yourselves in the lake before you're done. Uh, where follow you? Well, it, it's Sir Robert Norberton, sir. He's terrible jealous at doubts. Chance. Oh, I beg pardon, sir, but if you two strangers were as near his training quarters as that, he'd be after you, sure as fate. He ain't taken no chances, Sir Robert ain't. I think I did hear that he has a horse entered for the derby. Ah, and a good colt it is and all. He's carrying all our money, and Sir Robert's too. Oh, but by the way, gentlemen, begging your pardon, that is, I suppose you ain't on the turf yourselves. Oh, no, indeed. Just two weary Londoners who badly need some good Berkshire air. <laughs> well, you're in the right place for that. There's a good deal of it lying about. <laughs> But mind what I said about it. Strikes first and speaks after. Oh, he certainly shall, Mr. Barnes. Well, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, oh, Mr. Barnes, I, I wanted to ask you, what breed is that beautiful spaniel I saw in the passage just now? Why, oh, sir, that's the real Shuskin breed. Uh, there ain't a better in England than that. Really? I'm quite a dog fancier myself. If it's a fair question, what price would a dog like that cost? Oh, more than I could pay, sir. It was Sir Robert himself who gave me this one. That, oh, that's why you saw he was tied up. He'd, he'd be off back to all in a jiffy if I give him his head. Well, now, uh, you'll excuse me, gentlemen. Well, Watson, we're getting some cards in our hands. And we may see our way in a day or two. Will Norberton be back from London soon? Possibly. I think we might do well to enter the sacred domain tomorrow night, in fact. Hmm. It'll reduce the risk of bodily assault with him still away, and there are one or two points I should like reassurance on. Have you any theory, Holmes? Only this. Something happened a week or two ago which has cut deep into the life of the Shoscombe household. Now, what was it? We can only guess at it from its effect. And they seem to be of a curiously mixed character. Mm. But that should surely help us. It's only the colorless, uneventful case which is hopeless. Uh, true enough, as well. Let us consider our data. The brother no longer visits the beloved invalid sister. He gives away her favorite dog. Her dog, Watson. Does that suggest nothing to you? Nothing but the brother's spite? Mm, well, it might be so. Or, well, there is an alternative. But to continue our review of the situation from the time that the quarrel began, the lady keeps her room, alters her habits, is not seen save when she drives out with her maid, and refuses to stop at the stables even to greet her favorite horse. That covers the case, does it not? Well, save for the business in the crypt. Ah, yes, yes, the crypt. But let us suppose it, it's merely a scandalous supposition, a, a hypothesis put forward for argument's sake, but let us suppose that Sir Robert Norberton has done away with his sister. My dear Holmes, it's out of the question. Very possibly, Watson, very possibly. He's a man of honorable stock. But you do occasionally find a carrion crow among the eagles. Let us argue upon this supposition for a moment. We will. He's utterly in debt and may at any moment be sold up and his racing stable seized by his creditors. Now, he's a daring and desperate man. He derives his income from his sister. His sister's maid is his willing tool. So far, we seem to be on fairly safe ground, do we not? Granted. But he could not fly the country until he had realized his fortune. And that fortune could only be realized by bringing off his win with Shoscombe Prince. Therefore, if he had disposed of his sister, he would still have to stand his ground. He would have to get rid of her body in some way. 
With the maid as his confidant, that would not be impossible. The body might be conveyed to the crypt, which is so seldom visited, and it might later be secretly destroyed at night in the furnace, leaving behind it such evidence as we have seen. What say you to that, Watson? Hmm? Well, it's, it, it's all possible if you grant the original supposition. But that's monstrous. I think there's a small experiment which we might try tomorrow. It may throw some light on the matter. Hmm? In the meantime, if we intend to keep up our characters, I suggest we call for a glass of wine and hold some high converse upon eels and dace and that sort of thing. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, good, good morning, morning Mr. Barnes. Well, I should have thought you'd have been away to your fishing long before this. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Barnes, my friend here... Rather foolishly forgot to pack our spoon bait for Jack. <laughs> and as we gather there's none to be had hereabouts, we'll just have to forget about the fish. <laughs> if it was only an excuse to get away from London, really, we shan't miss it. Uh, well, perhaps you'll think of taking a walk instead. Some very nice walking in these parts there is. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's just what we're off to do now. I was wondering to my friend whether you mightn't be persuaded to let us take that dog of yours along with us. Well, I don't see why not at all, gentlemen. If you can be bothered with him, I reckon he'll be glad of the exercise. Uh, I don't seem to get ten minutes to call me on these days. Uh, it'll be a pleasure. I think we need the exercise as much as the dog does. This is the place, I imagine. Yeah, those are the gates, Holmes. The entrance to Shoscombe Old Place. I learned that the old lady's carriage comes through here almost precisely every midday as she starts out for her drive. Well, it's nearly midday now. Are you having for a glimpse of her? More than that. The carriage has to slow down while the gates are being opened for yeah. Now, when it comes through, and before it gathers speed again, I want you to stop the coachman with some question. Yes, and you? I shall stand behind this holly bush and see what I can see. And I think I shall also accidentally loose my hold of this good dog's lead. But quickly, Watson. I can see the carriage in the driveway now. Now, you know what to do. All right, um. Wait, now, mate. I say, pardon me. Yes, sir. Could you come in? Sir Robert Norberton at home today. Oh, sir, he ain't back from London yet. Oh, I see. Hey, hey, dog, will you? Hey, will you get my whip? Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Good morning, lady. You're back. Come here, boy. Come here. Uh, you're too valuable to lose. Well, Watson, that's done it. Uh, certainly caused enough excitement. Well, what did you see? There just seemed to be two of them in there. The maid, perhaps, and the old lady, and yet... Yes, Watson? Well, uh, the dog... Uh... Exactly. He recognized his mistress's carriage, but found a stranger inside it. Dogs don't make mistakes. But did you notice anything else? Well, I did think that voice, the, the, the one that called him to drive on, sounded remarkably like a man. Uh, and we've added one more card to our hand, but it needs careful playing all the same. I think we'll arrange for another rendezvous this evening with our friend Mr. John Mason. And what better place than the crypt? I can't stay very long, Mr. Holmes. Robert is expected back any minute. Oh, very well, Mr. Mason. But before you go, could you show us the bones you spoke of? Oh, you're in this corner. Oh. You were showing your lantern, Dr. Watson. Was here, you say? Why, oh, sir. Well, that's queer. They've gone. <laughs> As I expected. I, I don't understand, sir. I fancy the ashes of them might even now be found in that furnace you told us about. Why in the world would anyone want to burn the bones of a man who's been dead maybe hundreds of years? Ah, that's what we're here to find out. It may mean a long search, and we need not detain you. I fancy we shall get our solution before morning, there. Very good, sir. I'll be off, if you don't mind. I don't want Master to find me missing. Thank you, Mr. Mason. You'll hear from me soon enough. Now, Watson, let us have a closer look at some of these tools. 
What do you hope to find, Holmes? Hmm? I said, what do you hope to find? Ah, what have we here? A coffin on its end. Made of lead from the look of it. Yes, and unless I'm very much mistaken, recently tampered with. Just let me get my lens to it. Ah, yes, as I thought. Well, someone's tried to open it? And succeeded, I should say. Oh. Hmm, I think, uh, I think we shall now do the same, with the assistance of my trusty Jimmy. Always prepared, <laughs> Holmes. One never knows. <laughs> now, just a pull, Watson, if you please, and we have it. <laughs> now this. Oh. This is no ancient corpse, Holmes. This is... Listen. Someone's coming. And who the devil may you be? You hear me? What are you doing on my property? I also have a question to ask you, Sir Robert Norberton. Who are you, I say? Out with it or by... My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Possibly it is familiar to you. But in any case, my business is that of every other good citizen. To uphold the law. It seems to me that you have much to answer for, Sir Robert. Oh, it does, does it? For instance, whose body is this? And what is it doing here? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Everything can be explained, I assure you. Everything's all right. I'm pleased to hear it. Appearances are against me, I'll admit. But I could act no otherwise. I should like to think, sir. Oh, Come up to the house, please, and you can judge for yourself how things stand. You have gone pretty deeply into my affairs, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, or I should not have found you where I did. So you know in all probability that I'm running a dark horse for the Derby, and that everything depends on my success. If I win, all is easy. If I lose, well, I dare not think of that. I understand the position. I am dependent upon my sister, Lady Beatrice, for everything. But if I'm not mistaken, her interest in the estate is for her life only. Mm, you know that too, then. Well, it is so. For my own part, I'm deeply in the hands of the moneylenders. I've always known that if my sister were to die, my creditors would be on to my estate like a flock of vultures. Everything would be seized. My stables, my horses, everything. Well, Mr. Holmes... My sister did die a week ago. And you told no one? No, Dr. Watson, I told no one. How could I? If one word had got out, absolute ruin would have descended upon me within a matter of hours. I know these money lenders and their methods only too well. Mm, you see. If I could only stave things off until the derby, all would be well. If your horse wins. Well, if he doesn't... Well, in any case, surely your bets on the race and your expectations from it would hold good, even if your creditors did seize your estate. Also be part of my estate. And my chief creditor happens to be the same rascally fellow, Sam Brewer, whom I once was compelled to horsewhip on Newmarket Heath. Do you suppose he would try to save me? No, oh, Dr. Watson. If he got possession of the horse, he'd simply withdraw him from the race. My bets would be void and my ruin would be complete. Sir Robert, uh, what did your sister die? Dropsy. It has plagued her for years. Has a doctor certified for that effect? No. Then surely it is for a coroner to decide, not you. I catch your meaning, Mr. Holmes. But I assure you, many doctor would certify that her end had been in no doubt for months now. But it occurred just too soon for you. Well, what did you do? You answer? Ah, oh, yes, Carrie. Come in. Come in, Nollett. Uh, sir. Mr. Holmes, this is my late sister's maid, Carrie. Uh, Mrs. Nollett, I should say. How do you do, sir? And this is her husband, Nollett. Uh, how do these are the two people upon earth who can substantiate what I say. Very well. Well, as I told you, it occurred to me that if I could only stave things off until after the derby, all would be well. But obviously, the body couldn't remain in the house, even though there was no need for anyone to enter her room but the maid. So on the first night, Norlet and I carried it out to the old well house. I disclaim all responsibility. As I might expect. However, the responsibility is not yours at all, as it happens. You concealed the body in the well house? Yes. Then there was a complication over my sister's spaniel. It used to follow her everywhere. Turned up at the well house door and stood there, yapping continuously. Wouldn't go away. So you got rid of it to the landlord of the Green Dragon? Yes. Even so, I felt that some more secure place was needed for her body, and Norlet and I carried it by night to the crypt. There I... was no indignity or irreverence, Mr. Holmes. 
I do not feel I've wronged the dead. Uh, well, I can picture your thoughts. Perhaps you would have felt differently in my position. One cannot see all one's hopes and plans shattered at the last moment and make no effort to save them. Uh, it seemed to me that it would be no unworthy resting place if we put her for some time in one of the coffins of her late husband's ancestors. They lie in what is still consecrated ground. Rawlish and I... I disclaim... All right. We opened the coffin, removed the contents, and placed my sister inside, as you have seen her. As to the old relics, they were burnt in the central furnace at night. It seemed better than to leave them lying there for intruders to disturb. After that, it was but a case of arranging for someone to ride daily in your late sister's carriage, wearing her clothes, and keeping up the appearance that she was still alive and well. Just so. Now, let me see. Who could that have been? Mr. Norlett, I imagine you disclaim all responsibility in this as well. I'd like to know what you oh, think... Oh, Charlie! You... That will do, Norlett. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. He impersonated my sister and rode each day beside his wife here. Deceiving everyone except an unhappy dog who wondered where his mistress had got to. And you, it seems. It is my business not to be deceived. It was my duty to bring the facts to light, and there I must leave it. As to the morality or decency of your own conduct, it is not for me to express any opinion. Oh, there you are, Watson. I thought I heard you go out a few minutes ago. I did, by a newspaper. But our papers will be delivered before long, won't they? <laughs> I know, Holmes, but I wanted one before. Really, Watson, you've been uncommonly excited all afternoon. Yes, and now you're looking as smug as a well-filled cat. Pray let me into your secret. You know what today is, Holmes? Hmm? Today? Today? Christmas? Easter? St. Spurthens? Mm -hmm. I see nothing remarkable about it. It's Derby Day. The Derby was run this afternoon. Oh, really? Is that all? Uh, I should hesitate to bore you with the particulars. The derby was won by a horse named Shoscombe Prince, of which you have doubtless heard. He carried with him the blessing of my month's wound pension, that is all. Is, uh, the name is familiar. <laughs> <laughs> my dear Watson, do come and give me the benefit of your opinion upon this specimen. Yes. Really, if it were not for the microscope, I do not believe we should achieve half the results we managed to. That was Shoscombe Old Place, a Sherlock Holmes story adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle by Michael Hardwick, with Carlton Hobbs as Holmes, Norman Shelley as Dr. Watson, Frederick Treves as John Mason, and Godfrey Kenton as Sir Robert Norburton. Production by Frederick Bradnam for the BBC. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.